today where the Glen Urban is home free. When I think about Brother Glen Urban, I think about laughter. It's the first thing that comes to my mind. And uh, the scripture comes to mind from Proverbs 17, 22. It says, A merry heart doeth good like a mess. And I thought, Sister Vicki, he was an ordained pharmacist. Because he just went around spreading laughter and joy. And uh, he just, when he came into a room, it just, the, the smile just filled the room. And uh, he just had that joy and, and laughter about him. And uh, he, he was full of laughter. He would make you laugh. He enjoyed the laughter. He enjoyed making you laugh. And uh, he, uh, he was a blessing to all that knew him. And uh, I began to think another vivid picture, and uh, I saw it when I, when I came in, it was on the screen up there, uh, was that he had prepared for this day. He had prepared for this day. Because I remember he was he was one of the first who had a concert, an outdoor crusade, uh, years ago with David and the Giants. And uh, as we were preparing for the crusade, we said, we need to have a place for people to get baptized. And so uh, we went to the, to the funeral home of all places, and they gave us a burial hall. And we opened the thing up and filled it up with water, and Brother Glenn Urban has already been buried. He was buried in water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why he's prepared for this day today. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we're buried with him by baptism in the dead, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. He was buried with Christ and resurrected in the power of the Holy Ghost. So he's not dead, but he's alive in Christ. For 2 Corinthians 5 says, We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the close friends and family that have gathered today to celebrate this life. We thank you so much for the loan of Glenn Urban to this community, this family. God, we thank you for the years that we have been able to share with him. We thank you for his laughter. We thank you for his dedication and his love for the godly father and leader that he was brother, family member, friend to all. God, we thank you for his life and for the pattern that he has set before us. God, we pray today that as we celebrate this life, that we do all that pleases you. God, we ask for confidence for this family, for the friends, for those that have gathered today. God, may we do all to say all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
His preaching was uniquely anointed and engaging. And he played in me or honor. He is survived by his wife, Sister Nikki McDonald, Irvin, a daughter, Sister Jennifer Treach, her husband, Reverend Delbert Treach, a Montauk. Three granddaughters, Rachel Treach, Jordan Treach, and Ellie Treach, and a brother, the Danny Joe Irvin, his wife, Tabitha, of New Albany. Each night, Brother Irvin normally posts something on social media as a closing of the night. We would say, Good night, dear hearts, and gentle people. Just a couple days ago, the Spirit reached out to those who He loves. With a singular in your hearts and your children. Sister Irvin, Sister Jennifer, all the family, uh, wish we could take away the pain. Wish we could feel the voice and there's so many people who love you and are here to support you on behalf of your precious. But I know the prayers of your dad is already praying. Your husband has already prayed this day is to be used to God to carry you through the deepest path of life that ever has brought you. God's going to keep you in this one. The prayers he's praying will continue to minister to you, cover you, and to guide you as God is just continually committed to those prayers. I knew Brother Irvin for the past couple of years, three years, uh, primarily with this. Most of them were to come to see the grandchildren. And an Easter play or a Christmas play or to see them sing some special event. And uh, he was a unique individual. It's like everybody's fingerprints are different. Everybody's iris and their eyes are different. Some would see a unique person. He's made such an impact, so many. He had a unique type of faith in his life. He was going to smile, he was going to lie, he was going to tell a joke, he was going to do something to break the ice and make everyone feel comfortable in his presence. But I don't want to take time, I know we have several speaking today, and I'm going to be conscious of that, but I'm going to leave you with this. And I know we must be much said about his ministry. Yet there's a ministry that comes before our ministry in the kingdom of God. And that is the ministry to our family. He loved his family. And in fact, his family was, his family, God was his life. And you can see him light up when you have to hug him on the grandchildren. See his sister, Jennifer, saying you're being searched with him. Thank God for the role model your dad's giving, your husband's giving. And thank him for showing the way of how to be a minister, and how to be a father and a husband. And you will be his friend. But his impact, his, 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 his love and his faith will continue to minister to me and be their sustainer as an example for each of us to follow.
can't say that about everybody I've come in contact with. But I can truly really say that this home is still to see you again. If anybody made it in, his box is an example.
It goes on to say, for of the abundance of the heart is mouth to speak. It didn't take long to talk to Uncle Glenn that you would realize what his heart was set. His God and the people that he loved, especially his grandmothers. That love and compassion that he shows is evident in his conversation and in his preaching alone. You listen to him preach and you just feel the burden that he had for souls. The compassion that he showed was like none other that I've ever seen. It's something that I would strive for, was to be, to be half of that. And I'm speaking kind of on behalf of my dad right now. So for him, for his sake, I say that he's truly a backbone. He's somebody that you can lean on. And I don't know how many of you were privileged to know him close enough to say that he was a backbone, but to every one of, every one of us that knew him closely and personally knew that he was always someone you could count on. He was always someone that was right there. You would always see that he's praying for you. And I thank God today that he went on to meet his reward. And I'm also thankful that there was many prayers that he prayed that he got to see answered before he went on to meet his reward. And to each and every one of you today, I can assure you that he loved each and every one of you dearly. And I also know that he loved the truth. And if you have not received the plan of salvation, which is repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, I know that there is nothing more, I know without a doubt, there is nothing more that He would like to see than for you to pursue that. Once again, I want to say thank you on behalf of the family. And we covet your prayers. We thank you so much for your prayers that you prayed in the previous days. And we ask for you to keep continue to pray for us in the days to come. Thank you.
Here we have it over in those prayers. But she said she could feel those prayers. And I believe that. It stuck in my spirit. And uh, I believe that God allowed me to write this song that I want to sing. Just in house. Just reiterate. We, we cover your prayers. Oh, my God. 
Thank you for the night. What an honor it is to be standing before you that at this occasion we are all sad, heartbroken because of death, even though we know this is inevitable. But we are human. And uh, a little two weeks ago, uh, we were here on another service on one. Here's a young man at 57. But the God has told us it is a point of man once to die. We know that that is the force. We don't know when, how, or where. But the God that told us about life and death has promised that he would make a way for us to move out of here into a much better place than we've ever been. I uh, was thinking as they were speaking, Brother Mark mentioned the uh, Crusade over the fairgrounds back in the, I guess, mid-70s. We got a group here, Brother David Hub, and this group is called David Giants. And uh, their style of music wasn't exactly what we would find in the hymn. But their message was about Jesus Christ and Him crucified, rising again, and in power available for all of us that we can leave here and go home to glory. I thought about Brother Glenn Irvin and Brother Joe, Brother, they were teenagers, and uh, this kind of music they were singing, kind of upbeat, appeal to the young folks at that moment in time. And uh, Brother Glenn, he was, he was really in step with the uh, hippie movement. And then I had hair way over here, over here. And I didn't have much at all, and I was just as bad, but I thought uh, he could cut it some, you know. But let me tell you, about the second, I think, or third night, Fairgrounds over here, we even had the outdoor uh, crusade, and the glory of God favored that place. We had three or four hundred people there in the seats, and uh, first thing you know, people began to weep because they came in the presence of the Holy God. And as you know, they repented and was buried in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that once we're getting to Christ and that's the process, you can get baptized in Christ. You don't think your way in. You don't just have a, a mental consent block we got something there. That's the things in the Bible that we had to do. And that, uh, that doesn't sound right for a lot of folks. But Jesus made it easy because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And Brother Glenn Irvin found that out pretty soon. He was a quick learner. And he went from hippie to happy. And I'm telling you, he had the joy of the Lord. Praise God. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. And he wasn't in church too many months. He said, Man, I'd like to do something. I said, you the man I'm looking for. Where you been? And uh, he said, well, uh, what's the young folks doing? And uh, we had, I think maybe a minister was in that, and he moved. And so I said, what do you think, uh, uh, just temporarily, that you work with these young folks? Boy, did he ever want to go to work? I thought I was going to have to put him on his Rope on him. I said, Whoa, wait a minute, he wanted to do this and do that. I said, Well, that, that may not just be exactly at this moment, it might, it might be the season for that. But uh, 
He wanted to learn and he, he listened to the pastor. And I thank God for that. And the reason that he was able to grow in the Lord, he took God at his word. When God said, I'm the author, I started you out, and I'm the finisher. I'm going to be there when you draw your last breath or when the trumpet sounds. The devil doesn't want you to think about that. You, he, he, the devil is telling you, well, God's gone off for you somewhere. He didn't. He, he's not looking at you. He's looking at all these other folks. You're not as good as that member over yonder. All of that division and, and uh, fearful spirit that gets a hold of people. But I want to remind you again that same God started this church. He's going to be there at the end of it. And when it's time to shine, we're going to be out here. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let me, uh, I don't think it would be fair to him if I didn't tell you what he had in his soul. His soul. You know, you know talking, talking about going to heaven, if we don't tell folks the way we don't really do what's good. And uh, Jesus said in John 10, and looking at verse 1, Very, very, I say unto you, he that entered not with the door in the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. That's what Jesus said. But he that entered out the door is the shepherd's sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and leave them out. And then down in verse 9, he has to explain this uh, parable that he's uh, using here. And they couldn't understand about the door, and they were probably looking for it. Wondering what is he talking about? But the Bible said plainly, verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to kill, or to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they might have life, and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So we find very quickly in the teachings of the Lord, he made his message simple. He never used over a four syllable word in all of his earthly ministry. He talked about fish, he talked about planting wheat, he talked about uh, things that people could relate to. And uh, I'm here to tell you. That a lot of people today are being fed psychology. They're being fed uh, tradition. And so, well, I believe it because Grandma believed it. But when Jesus got here, he just eliminated everything else. Even the law is no longer in effect. And that took place when they nailed him to a cross. And he said, It is finished. The old covenant went out three days later. Jesus Christ came up to be the head of the church of the New Testament. And washed by His blood, filled with His Spirit. And the Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, He said, is going to bring in your heart. So we have Christ in us by sin, which is the hope of glory. And if we don't have Christ in us, we don't have any hope of glory. I'm here to tell you today, there's only one door. And his name is Jesus. You can't, you can't get from here up there through Buddha. You can't get from here up there through Muhammad. Are you listening? And millions of people believe in those personalities, those heroes of yesteryear. But I'm going to stand on the word of God. And I love you. You can't take it from me. You can't get it out of my heart. I've been preaching 64 years. And it's just better now than it's ever been. Hallelujah. And I thank God that not only there's a brother Glenn, a brother of the Lord, but I like to claim him as my son. And we're called to say the gospel. 
And we need more and more young people, young generation, to turn their back on this world that is growing morally. And we we got so many problems, and I won't go into all of that, but let me tell you, this this world can't stand much longer if somebody doesn't turn things around and put God back in their culture. Amen. Everywhere we turn, the God of this world is going to you uh, invention of some kind. And people will fall for it. And people is sad, though, when you give them a word out of the word of God, and they'll just turn and walk, walk off. But to thank God for a young man and his brother, amen, that about 40 years ago knew there was something better in life than what they were experiencing. And you've got to be honest with God if you get anywhere. And that's all the Lord wants us as an honest start. To power your lead unto the great God of glory, our maker, creator. I don't have time to tell you what I got in my heart today, but I can tell you one thing. That this word of God is not going to change. These people that have fought the name of Jesus, they might as well make up their mind they're not going to win. Jesus said you will going to be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Jesus said come up and I want you to take this cross. Take up your cross and follow me. And thank God that he mentioned the yoke. That instrument that connects you. And if you get yoked up with Jesus, he said my sheep will hear my voice. And a stranger they will not follow. There is nobody going to talk you out of this as long as you yoke up with Jesus. If you understand he's your shepherd, not the people that you work with, not your kid folks, or anybody else's man on TV or radio, your shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he is still speaking in this hour if we'll only listen and be obedient to what God has said. I think about all the things that transpired in the New Testament and those that laid down their lives. But Jesus said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to provide grace for you. Paul was suffering with affliction and thorns of the flesh, which could have been in his inner He let somebody have a rod to beat him with. And that's what uh, the painters were accused of the wilderness, they were thorns in their flesh. And uh, Paul just, he, I guess he felt like, what, what can I do now? They put me in jail, they beat me, they stole me, and he prayed to God three times. And you know what God said? He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made of our mind of presence it is made of strong if, if I'm with you you haven't got anything to worry about they're not going to kill you until I am ready for you to come home aren't you glad that God has the upper hand he has the mind to say and I would uh, bid you today to remember that this journey requires one thing and God's been dealing with me for the last several months you've got to meditate this word day and night if you find it three times it's not day or night I guess you could do something else but he said I want you to meditate on this word I, I thank God I can get up wake up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and I can meditate and then God will speak to me through his word but Jesus said I'm looking for some disciples. I'm looking for some followers. I want to have a sheep and a flock of sheep that will hear my voice. And he said, if you love your father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. That's good. Pretty close home. How many people do you know that's been influenced? Come in the presence of God, get an experience with the Lord, go home. And the family says, that's not our belief. 
you're not going back to that place. But you better stand up because you're the one and the only one that's going to be accountable for your soul. Brother Glenn is the Lord says at home. He's made it. He'll have no trials. He'll have no sickness, no sorrow, no more pain. Praise God. And I was just thinking that this time by now, my mother was somewhere around the gate when he came in. And I know she went there to talk to us. She was talking to everybody. And she's telling him what came. Like, hey, oh, I'm so glad to see you. You, you, you all go be around here. You, you talk about gold. You talk about, uh, you know, these burning gates. It says, this is the river of life. Lord, you know, I, I got some things up here I need to talk to you about. Hallelujah. Today, to, to take God at His word, because God cannot lie. Amen. And I thank God for every one of you out here today, and I hope that you will just say, just say, I'm sorry you came too late because I'm ready to book. Praise God. God bless you, my prayer. And on behalf of the family, thank you for all your prayers and your presence today.
Somebody say we went to the hospital the other day to believe what Brother Davis said. We went down there to come to cheer and we left cheer. That's the kind of building it was. Amen. He was out to stop it until the cold never shot. And he was maybe just a little bit of a rebel. <laughs> maybe. And he was 100% Southern. Amen. That's Brother Irving. You didn't have to wonder. I remember. I remember a time when he was in Jackson. And I, I'm, I'm aware of the time right now. So just give me a few minutes, okay? Uh, I used to be the man of the hour. I learned from the best. And I've learned to sit down and we get it done. And he always told us to stand to be seen, speak to be heard, and sit down and we appreciate it. I'm getting to sit down, okay? But I, I remember uh, he called me. He was in Jackson, and we were up here, and we stayed in touch. I, I will tell you this. Uh, we would go down and visit on the weekends sometimes. And Brother Irvin did something my own kids wouldn't do for me. My kids would kill me. I tell you, I got my own kids. I got my own place, and we go see them. Brother Irvin said, Brother Irvin did something they wouldn't even do. He had never done it. When we go down to see them, Brother Irvin said, Brother Irvin put my wife and I in the master bedroom. And they took a spare bedroom over there and barely had a bed in it. You know what Sister Lana did to me? She put me on an air mattress. She put You're going to that air mattress. I mean, I love Brother Irvin more than he did my daughter. But he called me when they said, you know, you're not going to believe what I did. And I just thought, he had gone to the library and he was looking for a particular book. And it had a, it was a book about Pentecostals and he couldn't find it. So he, he, he checked around and finally found it and it was in the cult section. He came out of the loop. He went to that library and he said he, he gave her a hot study right there on the spot. And by the time he left, that book was in a different section of the library. We traveled many miles together. I remember one particular time, I'm not going to go over the long take of this, it was so funny. He and I went to a commission rally in Knoxville, Tennessee, one year in the spring. And Knoxville being close to the mountains and everything, it was in April and uh, we knew it was going to be cold, so we, we went prepared and it had actually snowed that morning. I mean, it could have snowed better than these we get in Mississippi. So we went out to Shoney's Deep Breakfast and we had on our trench coats. He and I had a high on a trench coat. And, you know, and all of a sudden, before we had a car, the sun came out. So we grabbed our sunglasses. <laughs> we're standing in this Johnny waiting area and, and standing there in the trench coats, our arms folded, sunglasses on. We must just look all our age. She looked at she said, he wants to know if you're sick of ages. <laughs> we always got to be glad about that. Well, that's the secret about what we were there for. We made an impression on that young man. Psalm 37 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I believe him long enough to know all those plans we had. Like we could joke to God. You know, the one thing we did right was we just talked to God. And, you know, most of the rest of it we got wrong. But I thought about Brother Irvin, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. We see a good man before us today, and he walked with God. I heard somebody ask the question the other day, who's going to say the Thanksgiving prayer now? when the family gets together. Family, I want you to know, you know Brother Urban prayed for every one of you probably daily 
who's going to pray now? Come on. That was the kind of man Brother Urban was. And the Bible says that though he fall, he would not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I want to read a passage in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. In verse number 51, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the corruptible must put on the incorruption, and this mortal must put on Immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. I don't think we really get that sometimes. We have all these preconceived ideas of what we want when God got it already made out. And the scripture in Psalms says, though he fall, he will not be utterly cast out. This is not the end. This is not the last. You will hear Brother Urban. I've been looking for somebody to play the harp on today. Wake us up, but nobody did. I guess we're going to have to go and hear him play. But though he fall, he will not be utterly cast out. For the Lord of all the him with his hand. Oh, death, where? Is thy sting? O Ray, where is thy victory? Without hope, this is fine. With hope, it is just the beginning. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this mortal is going to put on immortality. And death is going to lose. The brave has lost the battle already. We don't have any worry about it. We know the life he lived. And what's been said today is just a reiteration of his life that he has already preached his funeral with. I believe it was Paul in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, when he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I have kept the faith that was Brother Urban Brother Urban was a warrior I saw a sign victory uh, Christian Academy warrior Brother Urban was a warrior he was a fight he uh, stood up for this gospel he fought the sickness and the, the infections and he, he fought with everything within him Paul said, now there's a link for me of renown, of righteousness. And, and he let us know what just was just for everybody that was called of God. What about you? The Bible says for you to make your calling and election sure. You can't guess at it. You can't hope at it. You can't say, well, maybe I am. If I, if I, if I get to thinking of it, you better make sure. You need to be sure today. Brother Irvin's life changed as a young man. It's already been, been, been talked about. I remember the first time I saw him in the leather coat, that long hair, and those square toe motorcycle boots. He was cool. But that cool dude, he got, he got under conviction. He repented of his sins. Went out to an altar in that makeshift uh, revival. He repented of his sins. He got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins. And about two months later, God filled him with the Holy Ghost. During the camp meeting, Bethlehem, 
I think he told me Brother Wilson was jogging by back there one time. Spirit was moving Brother Wilson's back by the arms. Come on, Bill, with me. And then he mounted up in the altar. And then it went long, he mounted up full of the Holy Ghost. He answered the call to preach, and he lived from God everywhere he went. One of the most beautiful things was about Brother Irvin, and I see this as a probably the ultimate mark of success in his ministry. And that is when you look at his family, serving God, living for God, faithful. He didn't just get it in other people, he had it in his family. Amen? I mean, that's me. That's the challenge in our day that we're living in. I want to get this thing for yourself, but leave something in your family. That, that legacy of faith and obedience lives on after he's gone. Beautiful family. Three granddaughters growing up in the Lord. Amen. And I see great things as this legacy of faith continues on into the next generation. The Bible tells us that Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. I paraphrase a little bit like there. Brother Irvin walked with God and he is not today with us because God took him. I want to read something. Uh, I had look it up. Just remember that the uh, the preacher in Ecclesiastes said there's nothing to do with the sun. So if I, if I go a ways back to get this, just think about that. I thought about this last night as I was preparing. And as the old poem had the footprints, he did the same. If you remember. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed seen from his life. For he seen, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times of his life. This really bothered him. He questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk me all the way. But I have noticed that during the most troublesome times of my life, there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you would leave me. But the Lord replied, my son, my precious child, I love you and I will never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you only see one set of footprints, then that I carried you. Nothing to do with that. I don't want you to think about this. Brother Urban went in and surgery the other day with two sets of footprints. And then when it was over, there was only one set walked out of that room. And he was carried to his reward. Let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, we love you today. We're thankful for the time, the memories that you have brought to our mind today. The fond memories, the funny times, the serious times. We want to thank you for the impact that this man made on our lives. I want to thank you for the gospel that he preached and lived. I want to thank you, Lord, for this life that he lived before all men. We ask you today, Lord, to comfort this family. We pray, Lord, that you would wrap your arms around them, lift them up in this hour. I pray, God, that you would give them peace and pass them all in understanding. We pray, Lord, for the friends that there's such a hole in their life now with the passing of our dear brother. I pray, God, for the church that he founded, that you would help them to continue in truth and in faith and in soul winning, Lord, and, and preaching and teaching the word of God. I pray, Lord, for those young ministers that were called during his pastorship. I ask you, Lord, to put your hand on us today. 
every soul in this place, let these memories as they come back, let them remember most of all the God that he served, the gospel that he preached, and the life that he lived. We'll be careful to give you all the praise we ask it in Jesus' name. Strike up the bed, assemble the world. 